Hi, my name is Ben LaLiberty. I'm a PGY2 cardiology pharmacy resident here at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And I'll be presenting Don't Rub Your Heart the Wrong Way, Updates in the Management of Pericarditis. To begin, it's important to understand the anatomy and physiology of the pericardium. As you can see in the picture on the right, the pericardium is a two-layered sac that surrounds the heart. Between the layers is the fluid-filled pericardial cavity that serves as a lubricant. The pericardium is an important membrane. It serves as an anchor for the heart in the chest cavity that enhances cardiac chamber function, limits acute cardiac dilation, acts as a shield and barrier to infection and malignancy, and finally secretes prostaglandins to modulate coronary tone. What is pericarditis? Pericarditis actually belongs to a group of inflammatory heart conditions that includes endocarditis and myocarditis. Pericarditis accounts for 5% of emergency room admissions for chest pain and is associated with a 1% mortality rate. As you can see in the picture on the right, pericarditis is defined as inflammation and thickening of the two layers of the pericardium. The layers rub up against each other and myocardial tissue, producing a pericardial friction rub that we will discuss later in this video. There are four ways to characterize pericarditis. First, acute pericarditis is defined as a sudden onset of symptoms, whereas patients with chronic pericarditis exhibit symptoms that persist for greater than three months. Incessant or subacute pericarditis are when symptoms occur from four to six weeks up to three months. Finally, recurrent pericarditis is defined as an acute episode occurring after a four to six week symptom-free period. Overall, pericarditis is associated with significant morbidity and up to a 30% recurrence rate. Pericarditis may further be complicated by other pericardial syndromes, such as a pericardial effusion, where fluid accumulates in the pericardial cavity. This may cause shortness of breath, particularly on exertion, and chest pain. In rare cases, a life-threatening condition called cardiac tamponade may arise. This occurs from a chronic or acute accumulation of fluid in the pericardial cavity, where the pericardium becomes stiff and high intrapericardial pressures result in compression of the cardiac chambers and hemodynamic instability. Another rare complication is constrictive pericarditis, where chronic inflammation results in a scarred, thickened, and calcified pericardium that impairs cardiac filling. There are several etiologies of pericarditis. The major two etiologies include idiopathic or infectious causes. Up to 90% of cases are idiopathic or viral in developed countries. In contrast, tuberculosis is the most common in developing countries. However, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic pericarditis rarely may occur. Autoimmune causes of pericarditis are more common in patients with a history of autoimmune disease such as lupus and arthritis. These patients may be more likely to have recurrent cases. Blunt trauma and cardiac procedures such as arrhythmia ablation or cardiothoracic surgery may also cause pericarditis. Additionally, patients may experience pericarditis a few weeks after a myocardial infarction, known as Dressler syndrome. Malignancies and high concentration of nitrates, particularly in dialysis patients, may also precipitate pericarditis. How do our patients present? According to recently updated guidelines, diagnosis is made by exhibiting two of four major criteria. The first, pericardial chest pain is characterized by severe, sharp, stabbing chest pain that is radiating in nature. It is relieved by sitting up and leaning forward, and worse upon inhaling a breath or laying in a supine position. The second major criteria are ECG changes, which includes diffuse PR segment depressions and ST segment elevations, that are seen throughout the limb and precordial leads. This is caused by pericardial friction on myocardial tissue and may be misdiagnosed as a myocardial infarction. The third criteria is a pericardial friction rub, which is a high-pitched, scratchy sound heard on auscultation with a stethoscope and is caused by the two pericardial layers rubbing against each other. In recent studies, only about one-third of patients presented with an audible pericardial friction rub. The final major criteria is a pericardial fusion and occurs in around 60% of patients with pericarditis. While these are the four major diagnostic criteria, patients may also exhibit a low-grade fever, elevated cardiac biomarkers such as troponin, 
and elevated markers of inflammation, such as a high white blood cell count. Some patients may even be asymptomatic. Our pharmacotherapy for the treatment of pericarditis are medications that work on the arachidonic acid pathway to inhibit inflammation. Arachidonic acid is an omega fatty acid produced from phospholipids. It is then broken down into prostaglandins and thromboxanes by cyclooxygenase enzymes 1 and 2. Prostaglandins are associated with vasodilation, fever, platelet inhibition, and decreased gastric acid secretion, whereas thromboxanes produce bronchoconstriction and platelet irrigation. Aspirin is an irreversible COX-1 inhibitor in platelets. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 in different proportions depending upon the agent. And corticosteroids work on two pathways to inhibit both COX-2 and the formation of arachidonic acid. Colchicine has been used for thousands of years for the prevention and treatment of inflammation. There have been several recent studies of colchicine for the treatment of both acute and recurrent pericarditis and is now an integral agent for the management of patients with pericarditis. Since colchicine concentrates heavily in white blood cells, or leukocytes, it is believed colchicine inhibits leukocyte microtubule formation to prevent inflammation. Based on randomized control trials and the updated European Society of Cardiology guidelines, the treatment algorithm is similar for patients with a first episode of acute pericarditis, patients with a first recurrence of pericarditis, and patients with multiple recurrences. It is important to note that almost all patients had idiopathic etiologies and patients with tubercular or malignant causes were excluded, along with patients with underlying renal or hepatic dysfunction. Thus, tre treatment should be individualized for these patient populations. First-line therapy includes a combination of either aspirin at high anti-inflammatory doses or NSAIDs plus colchicine Gastrointestinal protection with, for example, a proton pump inhibitor is reasonable for the duration of therapy. Most patients should be able to be successfully treated with first-line agents. However, in patients with contraindications to aspirin or NSAIDs, they may receive low-dose corticosteroids in combination with colchicine. Additionally, in patients who fail combination therapy, low-dose corticosteroids may be added on for triple therapy. However, several retrospective studies have demonstrated that corticosteroids increase recurrence rates, increase hospitalizations, and increase side effects, particularly at high doses. Thus, corticosteroids should be avoided as a first-line agent and utilized in patients who have failed therapy or have contraindications. Steroids should also be avoided in patients with infectious etiologies, particularly tuberculosis, as studies demonstrate worse outcomes in these patients. Third-line agents include immune therapies, such as azathioprine, intravenous immunoglobulin, and anakinra. However, data is scarce. Last line includes surgical intervention, such as a pericardiotomy or removal of the pericardi pericardium, called a pericardiectomy. This table highlights the dosing information for our first and second-line agents. Aspirin and NSAIDs are given every eight hours for seven to 10 days until resolution of symptoms. They are then tapered every one to two weeks over one month. Colchicine is given at a dose of 0.6 milligrams twice daily. In studies, patients who weighed less than 70 kilograms or exhibited colchicine's dose-limiting side effect, diarrhea, were given once daily dosing. In clinical practice, if a patient has diarrhea, we'll continue to cut the dose in order to keep patients on colchicine while limiting side effects. This may mean half a tablet daily or every other day dosing. Patients who have a first episode of acute pericarditis should receive three months of colchicine therapy, and those with recurrent pericarditis should receive six months. It is important to note that colchicine should not be discontinued until after aspirin or NSAID therapy has been discontinued. Of note, before the guideline update, there are only limited non-randomized trials to support our first-line agents. Now all are 1A for high evidence and recommendation. In terms of prednisone for second-line therapy, doses should be between 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram once daily. In studies, patients were continued for up to four weeks at this dose, then tapered every one to four weeks, depending on disease severity. Doses should not be decreased more than 10 to 20% for a maximum of 10 milligrams. 
prednisone has a recommendation to avoid as a first-line agent and as a 2A expert opinion recommendation for patients who have failed first-line therapy.